The doors of the annex at the Algiers Motel smashed in that night. Loud footsteps marched up the stairs. You couldn't see anyone, but you could hear them. Hundreds, it sounded like. Doors swung open with a bang in each room. Those inside dragged out and lined up against the wall. Two white women, no more than 18, were made to strip, were ridiculed and verbally abused for the company they kept that night. Others in the motel were African-American men. A knife from an officer thrown on the ground in front of these men, dared by the officers to use to defend themselves. They just needed one to attempt for the knife and they would have had witnesses for their self-defense claim. Not one touched that knife. This is the good, the bad, and the pure evil. The story today is one of sadness that happened in the summer of 1967 when three young African-American men were killed by three policemen for no reason apart from racial hate. The three policemen tried to cover the tracks, but soon it all would unravel. However, none of those involved would ever be convicted. The lives of Carl Cooper, Aubrey Pollard, and Fred Temple were taken at the hands of those meant to protect him on July 26th, 1967. The Algiers Motel incident happened in Detroit during the night and early morning of July 25th, 26th, 1967. During this time, race riots were going on across America and would be often called the long hot summer of 1967. Detroit was no exception to these riots and it has its own, its own called the Detroit Rebellion and the 12th Street Riot. The 12th Street Riot was one of the roughest, bloodiest incidents connected to the long hot summer of 1967. The riots involved violent fights that erupted between African American residents and Detroit police. The Detroit riots began early on July 23rd, 1967. At the Algiers Motel on July 25th to early morning 26th, just a mile east from the riot where the riot started. Three innocent men were killed and nine others were beaten by a task force of police, state police, the army and National Guard. Those killed were just teenagers and of the injured, seven were African American men and two were white women. The task force had been ordered to search the area for a gunman or group of gunmen when reports came of gunfire in or near the motel. Of the three deaths that night, one was never explained as the body was found not where he was killed. The other two were justifiable homicides or self-defence, which is easy to say when you don't have a person to question it. So charges were brought forward of felon assault, conspiracy, murder and conspiracy to commit civil rights abuse. These were charged against three officers and a private security guard was also charged with assault and conspiracy. All of these men would be found not guilty. So like I said, the Detroit 12th Street riot broke out early on the morning of July 23rd, 1967. When the riots were ongoing, the Detroit police were nearly all white, half of which would be considered racist but yet were police in African American neighborhoods. The spark of the riot that night came when police raided an African American owned business called the Blind Pig, which was a speakeasy or an illegal bar. The Blind Pig was hosting a party celebrating the safe return of two Vietnam War, War soldiers. When police entered, they expected a small crowd but came across at least 85 people. They proceeded to herd those inside out into a waiting police van. The commotion gathered attention outside and a mob started to form. Tensions were high and anger on both sides was at boiling point. Just one act would explode the situation. And this act came when the owner's son jumped up on a roof of a car and threw a bottle towards the police. And all hell erupted. The mob had had enough. Violence was powerful. Business were looted, torched, smashed as the mob went from district to district in Detroit. The police had their orders. Do not contribute to the violence. Their aim was to prevent any escalation in violence. A curfew was started and many, to be fair, complied with it but some didn't. Fires broke out and at first the fire department did attend, but soon it became too dangerous with abuse from looters and even threats of snipers. To help tighten the restrictions, Michigan's Army National Guard was put on the streets to protect large businesses. State troopers and Army paratroopers were also deployed. So the Algiers Motel was over near Virginia Park and was owned by Sam Gant and McUnrath Pye, both of which were African-American. 
Before they owned it, it was owned by a white hotelier who barred any African Americans from entering. With the no new owners, who were decent businessmen, the police had their suspicions that the Algiers was a seedy place of drugs and prostitution. Because of this, the Algier was raided a lot by Vice Squad. At the back of the motel was a three-storey detached house that was called the Manor House or Annex. It was used as extra rooms for visitors. You could get the motel from Virginia Park and from a driveway up Woodward Avenue. The motel was in a U-shaped layout with an office, a pool and cabana rooms on the left. On the right was a two-storey wing of rooms around the parking lot. The annex at the back could be seen from Woodward Avenue. When the riots erupted, many sought refuge. Some were unfortunate visitors uh, to Detroit on the day, and others were locals. On the night of the 22nd of July, a soul group named the Dramatics were doing a gig. They stayed in the Algiers after the show. Now, three of the band members departed before the 25th, but three remained. These three were Roderick Davis, Larry Reed, and Fred Temple. The evening of the infamous incident, several others took refuge in the motel from the rioting. July 25, 1967, riots were in full swing and the National Guard were sent over at Great Lake Mutual Life Insurance to protect the building. The insurance building was one block away from the Algiers. Across from the Algiers was a store with its own dedicated security man, Melvin Dismukes. A little after midnight, guardsman Ted Thomas radioed in hearing gunshots around the Algiers motel. From this call came an order to all available police, troopers and guardsmen to investigate immediately. When they arrived, they reported seeing people acting suspiciously at the window of the annex. Seeing this and with the previous shots fired knowledge, they proceeded to shoot out the windows and storm the building through all entrances. Testimony from those inside painted a very different picture. Inside on the third floor of the annex were three young African-American youths, Carl Cooper, Michael Clark, and Lee Forsyth. There was also two white women, Julia Ann Heisel and Karen Malloy. They were all hanging out, listening to music and playing about. While messing around, Cooper took out a starter pistol, a play gun, and began to shoot blanks into the air. Just as a bit of fun, we were with a realistic gun sound. The laughing and joking turned into silence and screams when the windows of the room smashed in with a rain of bullets from outside. Accounts continued of those inside describing fear and panic erupting. Everyone fleeing to other rooms to hide while the doors were knocked in and authorities stormed the annex. Carl Cooper was the first fatality of the night. Those inside placed him on the third floor when he was killed but law enforcement all reported they found his body on the first floor. No one has ever been arrested for Cooper's death and no explanation was ever fully given or agreed on regarding the shooting. The only piece that was ever agreed was from both sides that Cooper was dead when the authorities entered. Cooper's injuries were related to a buckshot of a shotgun, which was the weapons used by Detroit policemen. But no one openly admitted to killing Cooper. The National Guard, the troopers and all police stated Cooper was dead when they entered. So a uh, whodunit still remains unanswered to this day. A federal conspiracy trial would be conducted on the incident. In it, the defence would suggest someone inside actually killed Cooper before the authorities entered the building. Those inside obviously denied this and assisted police shot into the room first and checked for people later. When authorities did enter, they went in search to find people. Those that did find, they lined up against the wall on the first floor. The officers then hit, bet and threatened death to each person against that wall. They wanted info on who had the gun and who was the shooter. The two women, both just 18, were made stripped naked, verbally abused and ridiculed for the company that they were keeping that night. At some point a knife was thrown on the floor in front of the men. The police shouted for them to pick it up. This though was a tactic. If the knife was picked up, then the authorities could accuse them of being armed, so an assault of killing would be a self-defence claim. The men against that wall knew better and no one touched that knife. So when the knife tactic didn't work, the men were taken one by one into a room by the police. While in these rooms, these young men were often threatened by guns, were told not to move and stay quiet. If they didn't do what they were told, the officer would return to kill them. Returning into the hall, the officer would pass comment that the person inside this room was no more. 
Reports are conflicting as to what happened next. Allegedly, an officer took one of the men into a room and fired a shot into the wall, making it sound like the man was shot dead. This was another scare tactic for information. This officer came out of the room and asked guardsman Ted Thomas if he wanted to kill one of them. Ted Thomas took a man into the room and fired into the ceiling. Aubrey Pollard was the next to be taken into a room by officer Ronald August. It was here that he killed Pollard, later claiming that it was self-defense. The odd thing was that a cartridge of a .300 Savage was found next to Pollard's body, a weapon not issued to police officers. When Pollard was found dead, he was also badly beaten around his head. Witnesses would say Pollard was beaten in the head with a rifle in the hall, so bad in fact, and so hard that the rifle had broke. The mental torture eventually broke the remaining victims, and they admitted to Cooper having the starter pistol, messing around and shooting blanks into the air. Just as this admission was given, gunshots rang outside, so the officers swiftly left. Two officers remained and escorted the victims out of the annex. The officers instructed them to run, run home and don't come back. If they did come back, they would be killed. Fred Temple, the member of the Dramatics Band, was the third and final person to be killed that night. But the death was strange as many of the victims who fled said Temple was still alive as they were fleeing. Temple would be found dead in a room in the annex. He was shot dead by Officer Robert Pally. Once again, the officer claimed he killed in self-defense during a struggle with Temple over Pally's gun. Right, so protocol of officers was to report police deaths or any deaths to the Detroit Police Homicide Bureau. But guess what? They never did so. I guess killing three innocent men and terrorizing several others slipped their minds. So these poor lost souls were left alone in the cold, dark motel until the next day, July 26th. On that day, Charles Hendricks, who was providing security for the Algiers, found the bodies and immediately called in the deaths to the Wayne County morgue. The morgue thankfully did follow procedure and called it the De Detroit Police Homicide Bureau. On the scene came Detective Edward Hay, a photographer and other patrolmen. It was around 3 a.m. but they began to examine the scene and remove the dead bodies. They found a knife near a victim, shells and cartridges but no guns. Guardsmen noticed flashes from the windows of the photographer and the policemen on the building's roof. The guardsmen shouted demanding to identify themselves. This didn't sit well with those examining the scenes. They felt unsafe and decided for now to abandon the investigation, returning later. The press got wind of the story. Now it wasn't the actual story, it was a story of gunfire exchange with snipers. Some ran it while others fact checked it. You know, part of the job. One of the fact checkers was the Detroit Free Press. They interviewed witnesses, all whom stated that they were unarmed and the dead were not snipers as claimed. The incident and killings came to the attention of Congressman John Conyers. He was also connected to the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, or the NAACP. Conyers held a conference with the witnesses regarding the conduct of the military and police. You can guess how that went. With such cries, the US Department of Justice launched an investigation. Witnesses gave interviews to Assistant District Attorney Robert Murphy. He then passed the interviews to the Detroit prosecutors on July 29th. The Free Press continued their research and even got a pathologist, Dr. Surley, to examine the deceased. He found that all three were killed inside the annex building. All three were shot not once, but twice, from behind a close range. They also were murdered in defensive positions. Just five days after the incident, the Detroit News ran a story of one of the survivors named Robert Lee Green. He suggested it was the National Guardsman who murdered the men that night in the Algiers. The first charge to be brought was against the security guard Melvin Dismukes, who was an African American and was guarding the store across from the motel before the incident. The charges against him was felonious assault on James Sorter and Michael Clark on the first floor hallway in the annex. He got out on bail for $1,500. The trial began in May 1968, with an all-white jury to decide his fate. Within 15 minutes of deliberation, Melvin was found not guilty. So officers David Senek, Ronald August, and Robert Pally all confessed contributing to the killings of Pollard and Temple, so they were charged with murder. 
They were arrested and spent just one night in jail, released on a bail of $5,000. At first, August stuck to the they were dead when we got their story. His second statement he admitted to his shooting Pollard while insisting it was done in self-defense. When pre-trial examinations were being conducted, Ted Thomas, remember him? He was the National Guardsman and he identified August as the one who shot Pollard and went on to identify Senek as the one who questioned and committed the beatings. The Algiers wasn't the only crime Senek was connected to that night. It's believed that Senek killed two other men on the same night during the riots before he got to the Algiers. Senek would claim he never seen August or Pally fire the weapons, but this was contradicted by his survivor Michael Clark. He testified that August and Pally took him into a room and they threatened him at gunpoint. Judge D. Massey oversaw the pre trial and ruled to indict August for Pollard's murder but dropped the charges against Pally. Now, Reverend Dan Aldridge had a feeling that the trial wouldn't favour the victims, so he organised a coalition of Detroit African American leaders and they conducted their own tribunal. In the tribunal, they listened to the interviews, reviewed the evidence, and convicted August, Pally, Dismukas, and Thomas of murder with a sentence of death. Obviously, this was a mock trial. However, it did give just a small, tiny feeling of justice to them. The mock jury even had some famous African Americans, such as Rosa Parks and writer John Keelans. During the tribunal, they could come and watch, and one such man entered and watched silently. He never revealed himself or spoke to anyone, but this man was Dismukas, the security guard charged with felonious assault but found not guilty. Charges and arrests weren't over yet. August and Pally and Senek were arrested for conspiracy under Michigan law on August 23rd. This trial began September 27 in recorder's court with Judge Skimanski and lasted three days. Charges were all dismissed in December. With the dismissal of Pally in pre-trial, it was appealed by prosecutor Callahan. Judge Skimanski ordered the pre-trial judge, Dimaski, school to take the more testimony. Pally's attorney and Mr. Lippitt appealed to the Michigan Court of Appeals, but they declined to hear it. Not to give up, Lippitt went higher, appealing to the Supreme Court who kicked it back to Wayne County Court of Appeals in 1970. They decided in 71 to send it back to the recorder's court, but once again, more testimonies. And full circle. Did you enjoy the merry-go-round? But finally, in the spring of 1972, the appeal was heard in the Detroit Recorder's Court, but in the August, the murder charges were dismissed. The reason was all down to the technicality. Confessions were given, including pallies, were all done without informing them of their rights. Although they were thought as suspects, they were never treated as such, and were never given the choice to remain silent. There was no reason for this, it wasn't that it was just forgotten. Detective Scalato was convinced if their rights were read that they would have clammed up and got no confessions. Scalato knew it would be inadmissible but wanted a record of guilt. Although it could never be used, in his mind there was, it would be always a record of acknowledgement of it. Ronald August's murder trial was held back in the summer of 1969 in Mason, Michigan. It wasn't held in Detroit due to the publicity around the incident. Remember Pally's attorney Lippitt? Well, he would be August's attorney also. Lippitt's aim was to blame the victim, Pollard. He called him antisocial and even suggested he was a potential killer. Regarding the mur murder, he reportedly stated it was justifiable homicide. The prosecutor, Avery Weiswasser, aim, his aim was to prove the murder was intentional and premeditated. So going down the justifiable homicide track, August admitted to killing Pollard, but insisted it was in self-defense, as Pollard grabbed for his shotgun. The media covering the trial, including Detroit Free Press, all mentioned the amount of descriptions regarding the shooting was equal to the amount of witnesses. In other words, a lot and all different. Survivors were called for testimony, but two failed to appear. Those were Green, who was one of the African-American men, and Heisel, who was one of the two of white women. Guardsman Thomas was called to give his testimony. He admitted to taking a young man into a room and firing his weapon into the ceiling. He spoke about seeing Senek 
hand a shotgun to August, insisting he shoot one. August then took Pollard into the room. Thomas never heard the sound of a struggle, but he did hear a sound of a shotgun discharging, followed by a thud similar to a body hitting the floor. This body was Pollard's. Another officer gave testimony saying after Pollard's death, he heard Thomas mumble, this was police business or this was bad business. He wasn't fully sure which, but straight after he said he was leaving and left. Thomas ended his testimony stating that August never uttered a word throughout the whole incident. Survivors were called, including Karen Malloy, one of the two white women, to give her detailed account of that night. She placed Cooper on the third floor playing with a starter pistol in a room. She spoke about him firing blanks and minutes later the glass at the window was crashing in. She spoke about the fear, the panic inside, how they all fled into hiding. Karen took safety in Robert Green's room until an officer with a rifle appeared. Before she was taken out into the hall, Karen said the officer shot into the closet, shot into the bathroom and then demanded to know if anyone was in those places. Again, shoot first, ask later, like previously said. Once in the hall, Karen described the horrors that happened, seeing many, if not all, the African men beaten and taken one by one into rooms by officers. She confirmed she wasn't beaten, nor the other white female, but they were made stripped, were jeered at and verbally abused. But she couldn't identify August as one of the officers. She never saw who took Pollard and so couldn't identify August as the one to murder Pollard. Philip Martin, John Fogger and Archie Davis, all state troopers, were also called for their testimony. They all confirmed the whole lineup, the beatings and the taking of individuals into rooms. All troopers testifying agreed to hearing guns going off but insisted it was all part of the game to scare the victims for information. Davies and Fonger testified after one of these gunshots, a man in a riot helmet emerged inject ejecting empty shells from his weapon, stating that one tried for my gun, followed by the room is secured. Martin testified no sniper weapons were ever seen and those inside gave no resistance. Bonger felt uneasy with the whole situation and reported it back to his supervisor as it was playing out. This supervisor immediately gave the order to leave as he too wasn't in agreement with what was happening. Someone with a conscience, I guess. Now August, he had some set of balls on him because he took to the stand to testify his defence and it involved a lot of finger pointing and throwing people under the imaginary bus. He stuck to his story that Cooper and Temple were dead when he entered the first floor. He said when he got to the hallway, people were already lined up, so he had nothing to do with that. First, he pointed at Senek. August claimed Senek told him to take Pollard into a room and shut the door. August described talking to Pollard, who was scared and didn't want to die. August advised Pollard to answer honestly, do what he says, and nothing will happen to him. During the questioning of Pollard about the sniper, Augur alleges Pollard pushed him, grabbed his gun, aimed and fired. But the safety was on so there was no discharge. August continued that Pollard lunged for him and so August shot Pollard dead. So August has blamed Senek and the victim Pollard but he wasn't stopping the blame train there. August testified that Pally and Senek advised him not to file a report even when he checked the next day, a report still wasn't filed. He placed a lot of blame on Pally, stating that he was the radio officer, so it was up to him and his job to call in the incident, and also for his job to get medical help. Now when reports were filed, August claimed Senek and Pally completed a joint report. This was corrected two days later, and an individual reports were submitted. August admitted his first report wasn't really true, so he submitted a second one. In this one, he confessed to shooting, but insisting that he shot in self-defense. The trial concluded June 9th, and as the all-white jury was sent out for deliberations, the judge, a Mr. William Bear, advised, suggested, heavily hinted, that they convict in first degree or acquit. Obviously, this suggestion didn't go unnoticed. The black leaders were not impressed. They suggested the judge had all but guaranteed an acquittal. So the jury had their instructions, even if they thought second, third degree, manslaughter didn't matter, it was first degree or acquittal. Would you like to guess the verdict? 
that's right, not guilty. Right, well, we'll move on. Remember back at Recorder's Court? Judge Skimansky dismissed the conspiracy charges. And this didn't sit well with Assistant U.S. District Attorney Kenneth McIntyre. He pushed for it to be heard again, but this time as a federal case. On May 3rd, 1968, a federal grand jury indicted Dismiscus, August, Pali, and Senek on the charge of conspiracy to deny civil rights to those inside the motel. Guardsman Thomas Skiff being indicted as his testimony against the others was far more valuable than charging him. The trial though met some delays. First it was delayed because of the horrific assassination of Robert Kennedy on June 6th. Then it was delayed because of the publication of the book Ajira's Motel Incident by Jaron Hersey. The book gives the stories from survivors, victims' families and authorities in the raid. It also identified those involved in the killings. So the trial was delayed to let the hype from it die down. Because of the book, a request of venue change was also a part of the delay. It wasn't until September 1969 that Judge Roth finally set the venue in Flint, Michigan. This was a massive pro for the defense because in Flint, it was next to impossible to have an African-American jury. So once again, an all-white jury was sworn in and the trial began in early 1970. So Julie Heisel didn't testify in any other trial, but she did in this one. She was one of the two white women inside the motel that night. She confirmed the pistol story, the hallway lineup, but couldn't say for sure if the men on trial were actually there. However, another survivor, James Sorto, could. Although he identified the men, he, could, he did admit to hearing no gunshots. He spoke about being beaten multiple times, so many times he lost count so he may have been unaware of what exactly was going on. But anyway, both of these witnesses yet again confirmed Cooper was alive when the police entered. Senek's lawyer took the self-defense road, which is hard to argue when the other side is dead. But the victim, Temple, was handcuffed when he allegedly tried for Senek's gun, which is a bit hard. State trooper Rosima gave testimony that he heard what sounded like a struggle from the room Senek and Temple were in. This then was followed by a gunshot. It was also recorded by a few that Senek was heard yelling, he's got my gun. Rosima would eventually enter the room and testify seeing Temple wounded but breathing. As far as he's aware, no medical help was ever called for or given to Temple. Many witnesses supported the cover up idea by Senek, August and Pally. Police Lieutenant Baroni gave testimony regarding the first report they submitted. Entering a motel, seeing the lineup, seeing the victims, who they recorded as wounded, and then they left. That was the first filed report. But on July 31st, August changed the report to include he never fired his weapon inside the motel and that he seen no guardsmen on the site. Just two hours after this change, August changed it yet again. Homicide Detective Everett testified to this change. In the newer change, August admitted to shooting Pollard and that Pally shot Temple. August insisted his shooting of Pollard was done in self-defense. Interestingly, these revisions weren't requested until after the media coverage came out. August was not happy with how he was being portrayed as in the media and was claiming it was all incorrect and he did nothing of that was being suggested. The jury was sent to deliberations which lasted a total of 10 hours, and once again, the all-white jury found all four not guilty. After all this, none of the three Detroit policemen ever worked again for the Detroit police. The security guard, Dismiscus, went into security for the Detroit Pistons. His life would be one of fear and recluse, as he would receive death threats from the Black Panthers. The policemen left Detroit to get away from the publicity. The lawyer Lippitt went on to become a circuit judge in Oakland County. Since the incident, the Detroit police have become a more integrated police force. The motel itself closed for a short while and reopened as the Desert Inn. In 1979, the motel and manor house were flattened as part of an urban renewal project. Where it once stood is now an open green space known today as Virginia Park. Families of Pollard and Temple filed lawsuits against the police. The city of Detroit settled with them in 1976 for a total of $62,500 each. 
No money can ever undo what happened that night and the justice system with all of the evidence and confessions completely failed them all. But they fought back, speaking out for those who couldn't and brought it to the world's attention through the media. It's because of their bravery and determination that this story is known today. In the words of Mahatma Gandhi, to forgive and accept injustice is cowardice. This is the good, the bad and the pure evil. Join us next time when we'll be looking at the pure evil that was Ted Bundy. Until next time.